Hello, welcome everyone to a new lecture of the No Man's Land webinar series on pre-modern Islamic manuscripts. My name is Bruno de Nicola. I am the PI of the project No Man's Land based here at the Institute for Iranian Studies of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. Today, I have the great pleasure of hosting a lecture by Dr. David Duran Gedi. David has done extensive research on the history of Iran in the pre-modern period, especially in the period of the great Seljuks in Iran, Central Asia and Anatolia between the 11th and the 13th century. He has published extensively on these uh, subjects, uh, especially his book on Iranian elite and Turkish rulers, uh, A History of Isfahan in the Seljuk period, you might know has been published a couple of years ago. Now, since 2023, uh, David has joined the Asia Africa Institute of the University of Hamburg on the project dealing with Persian letters from medieval Anatolia financed by the um, German DFG. Um, today, uh, he will speak about the topic uh, with a presentation entitled Persian Insha from Khurasan to Anatolia, a glimpse through the Marashi manuscripts 11.136. David, thank you very much for accepting uh, to do this. Um, thank you for accepting the invitation, and I am uh, very much looking forward to hear your talk. The floor is yours whenever you are ready. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you for uh, attending as well. And uh, so today we'll be discussing the manuscript, which is the focus of my DFG uh, funded project that I am leading now at the University of Hamburg. And this is a manuscript which contains a 13th century Insha from Anatolia. So um, this manuscript is extremely significant for a number of reasons. First, it had never been investigated until recently. Second, it is one of the oldest Insha from Anatolia, uh, perhaps the oldest, and it is a key source to understand the critical period just before and after the Mongol invasion of Anatolia in 1243, uh, after which the independent Seljuk state will become a vassal state. Um, well, before delving in the manuscript, I would like to, to uh, recount a few uh, very simple facts about Insha that might be necessary uh, to get in mind to understand the uh, complicated genesis of this manuscript. And after this uh, quick reminder, I will uh, tell you the old story of this manuscript in the 20th century. Then I will try to tell you the old story of the genesis in the 13th century. And finally, I will give you some insight um, uh, from uh, into persography and to uh, the history of Anatolia during uh, Mongol rule. So let's start by the beginning. By the beginning. Um, <clears throat> well, there is two ways to approach Incha. The first is to focus on the works. So the author of these Incha works, and then we're going to uh, be busy about the content of these works, about the hard data, what they tell us about uh, the event um, recounted in the letter. The second approach involves studying the transmission of these works. And these, for this, we need studying the manuscript. So with the manuscript Maharashi, uh, 1136 that I'm going to present today, we are going to mix these two approach because it's not possible to study the work without the manuscript. I will, you will understand this why later. Um, first point, Persian Insha, emerged during the Seljuk rule. As it is well known, the, the, the Seljuk uh, conquered Iran and made Persian the language of their administration instead of Arabic. However, the earliest serving, surviving monuments of Persian Insha uh, date to one century after the Seljuk conquest. And here I'm speaking about the works, not the manuscript. Um, second point, Persian Insha emerged in Eastern Iran. Eastern Iran, that can be called Southern Central Asia or Greater Khorasan, whatever you like. And it basically uh, emerged 
in the triangle between Nishapur, Ghazni, or Genj, with Marv at the center. Ghazni being the capital of the Ghaznavid, Marv the first capital of the Seljuk, and then the capital of Sanjar, um, the Sultan of the Second uh, Imperial Era, as Koyman uh, aptly termed it. And um, this is where Giovanni uh, wrote the first known Insha work in Persian, the Atabat el Katabat. And uh, in Nishapur, with the nearby region of Bayhak and Jovain, uh, from this region came all the great secretary that were so important for the development of Persian Insha. And Orgenj, finally, finally, the capital of Akhwarez Shah, will replace the Seljuk as, uh, as the major power in Khurasan and uh, very soon in Iran in the second part of the 12th century. So this is where lived uh, Rashid ad-Din Vatpat, and the less famous but uh, not less influential, Din uh, Baghdadi, the author of Tawassul uh, al-Tarassul. So this was a second point. Uh, all these secretaries wrote in Persian, but they were very uh, well trained in Arabic, and they can use Arabic in Shah. And the third point we need to remember is that Arabic Insha precedes Persian Insha by several centuries. Uh, the first works date to the ninth century. You have the first manual for secretary during the Abbasid period. But actually, when the caliph has, uh, had not any power anymore, I mean, the power uh, had fallen into the hand of a Turkish general, and very soon it will uh, fall into the hand of the an Iranian dynasty, the Bugid. Um, significantly, the first work are uh, written in Baghdad by one Baghdadi. But this Baghdadi is very different from the Baghdadi we just mentioned, who wrote a Persian Insha in Organj, because the Baghdadi from Organj is not from Baghdad, but from Baghdad, which is a little place uh, near Samarkand, I think. Um, the golden age of uh, Arabic Insha is the Buyid period, where you have, at the same time, writing manuals, which combines advice and sample text, and also letters of major uh, epistolarian, like Ibn al-Amid, like Sahib ibn Abbad, and like the, the famous member or the member of the family. Famous Sabi family. The first two were um, Iranian and Muslim, but the Sabi uh, were not Iranian and not Muslim. And uh, they were very influential as well. Um, so Incha works continued in Arabic, of course, after the Bugi, but not in Iraq. It emerged or it re emerged in Egypt which was becoming the, the center of the uh, Arab world uh, from the uh, Fatimid period onward. And so you have didactic manual, but from the 11th, 12th century in Egypt. And of course, later during the, uh, the Mamluk period. Um, fourth point and last point, uh, the form of the Insha work from their onset in Khorasan was fixed. Fixed were the categories where from the beginning, uh, the author or, of our work classified their documents between Sultaniyat and Ikhwaniyat. The Sultaniyat being, being the, the, the letters uh, about the functioning of the states and the Ikhwaniyat. Um, well, it's not so much the private letter as the letter sent in private capacity. Um, so the exception is Rashid ad-Din Batfat, as he is going to mix, and is an exception for this, in his uh, Insha work, letters in Arabic and in Persian. And so the categorization will be uh, along the, the language, not the Sultaniyat, Khwaniyat. Um, in Mayhani Dastur al-Dabiri, for example, which is the most 
the first writing manuals. Uh, you have first principle about how to write. So it starts very um, uh, from the material side and how to choose the calam, the paper, the writing convention, the autographs. He describes the part of the letters and the end of the words is sample letters classifying in six categories. And the two main categories are the Ikhwaniyat and Sultaniyat. I will come back to this uh, work later because the author of our manuscript in Anatolia obviously wanted to emulate Mayhan. And um, the type of work is also uh, very fixed. You have the same type of Insha work from the beginning. You have both manual, secretarial manual with example, like Mayhan is that to the WD. And you have what we can call curated collection of letters. So uh, you have a chancellor like uh, Rashid ad-Din Badfat or a Jovaini who is going to gather his own uh, letters, but he's going to organize them along the categories we just described. And um, the styles is uh, also uh, fixed from the beginning. So the style of the Insha is not the style of Tariq Ibai Haki. It's characterized by ornate prose, masnu, which include uh, heavy reliance on uh, the satch, the rhyme prose. For example, the, the very title of Rashid Beddin Vatfat uh, Insha works, Arai Ser Khawatir wa Nafait Ser Nawadir, is a very good example of satch. Uh, now, all these authors, and this is important, insist in their preface, because they all write a, a little preface, on writing in a very clear style, which for us is a little bit counterintuitive, because when we read the letters, it doesn't seem very clear to us. But this is our own perception in the 21st century as a mostly Western historian. Well, actually, not only Western historian, historians, because the great Iranian specialist of Iranian literature, uh, Malik Eshwara Bahar uh, wrote in the 20th century, I mean, he deplored the style of the uh, Monsharat and uh, of the historiographical works. And he, he speaks of a decline of, uh, of the facade, of the corruption of, of a Persian style. Uh, but we should remind that this style is the style which was the norm at the time for writing historiography, for writing letters. And uh, the best example of this is, of course, uh, Nasret, Nasrullah Munshi, who was living in Khorasan and was the creator of the Ornat prose in Persian uh, with his famous uh, rewriting of Kaila Dimna in Persian that uh, all students of literature in Iran had to study in the first or second year uh, of their study. Um, and last point, the regional development. So we saw that Persian Insha uh, emerged in Khurasan during the Saljuk and Khwarim Shah. It waned during the Mongol period, well, for reasons quite obvious, uh, but re-emerged in East Iranian world during the Timurid with the uh, famous collection of uh, of Khandamir, of uh, Vahez Kashefi, uh, of Abdullah Morvarid, of course. And, um, and here I salute my, my colleague, um, Colin Mitchell, the specialist of Vahez Kashefi. After Khorasan, uh, the first region where Persian Insha emerged was actually uh, Anatolia, uh, which was open to. Uh, Rum Seljuk in the end of the 11th century. But the Persian Insha emerged uh, relatively uh, with delay. And we see it in the 13th century only, which indicates that there is a strong connection between the rise of Insha and a strong state. Because in the 12th century, the Rum Seljuk state was not that strong. Um, after the uh, 
Yes. Um, so after the, the, the beginning of the 14th century, which is an era that, uh, period that Bruno uh, knows very well for his investigative as, as well, a Persian incha uh, written uh, in Anatolia, uh, we don't have new, well, as far as I know, new incha written in Persian. But it doesn't mean that Persian incha disappeared from Anatolia. Actually, it continued to be copied. And if you look at the inventory of the Ottoman Palace Library uh, at the beginning of the 16th century, uh, it's almost entirely about Persian works in the same uh, mass new style that we just uh, spoke of. There is 136 a title on epistolography, diplomatics, or not prose, and only four in Turkish. And of these four in Turkish, two are translation from the Persian. And we are here in the 16th century. So we can speak with uh, Markus, Markovic of an outside status of Persian in the Ottoman period, and of course in previous uh, in the previous century in Anatolia. Uh, except Anatolia, uh, we saw also the rise of Persian Incha in India with Amir Khosro in the period of the Delhi Sultans. And um, later under the Mongol, or the Mughal, sorry. Uh, what is actually striking is that Persian in Western Iran appeared rather late. Uh, we find it, we don't find any curated collection as we do in Anatolia or India or Khurasan, of course. Uh, in Western Iran, uh, before, uh, before very late. Um, and, um, but the difference is that Persian in in Western Iran continued uh, until the Safavid, for example, a few years ago, Rasul Jafarian published uh, Munshat et Soleimani, which is a, a manuscript from the late Safavid period, and uh, until uh, the Qajar, without much difference from the early beginning. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the give you some elements to give you the broader picture to better understand the manuscript now that we are going to deal with. Um, well, I can ask you if you have followed so far, I hope. And uh, let's turn to the story, because it's a real story of uh, this Maharashi um, manuscript. Um, so let's start with the um, location. The Maharashi library, as you know, is in Qom. And that's the first oddity. Uh, well, Qom, uh, Sayed Hossein Maharashi founded this library just after the, the revolution, and it's now one of the major libraries for uh, Persian and Arabic manuscripts, actually. And uh, he is himself buried, as you can see, uh, in the entrance of his library. Uh, but what is odd is that uh, most of the Persian, well, many of the Persian manuscripts that we have are now in Turkey. And it's very rare to have a Persian manuscript written in Anatolia to be found in Iran. Well, this is the case of our manuscript. He took, uh, let's say, the, uh, the other direction, a little bit like myself. Um, Well, for example, an example of a manuscript that I studied recently, which was written in, an, in Iran, and you find now in Istanbul, it's the uh, Bayaz of uh, Hendusha Narchaban, which is uh, almost contemporary with our manuscript. Um, it's not the only manuscript of Insha that you find uh, written in Anatolia that you find in Iran. For example, there is also the Misbah al-Rasail, which was written by Majdi at the beginning of the 13th century, but uh, it remained exceptional. And this also explains why this manuscript has remained unnoticed so far. Um, <clears throat> what do we know about the story? Where, how did it get to Qom? So for this 
uh, we can rely on a note inside the manuscript uh, from uh, Hussein, actually, no, his son, Mahmoud uh, Maharashi Najafi, who established that the manuscript was in Qom in, uh, at the end of the 20th century, in 1997. Before that, the manuscript was in private hands. Uh, it was in the private library of uh, Hossein Nahjavani. So this Nahjavani is not to be confounded, of course, with uh, Hendusha Nahjavani. Uh, Hossein Nahjavani was a rich bazari of the 20th century, living in Tabriz, and also a bibliophile, and he is uh, considered as the father of the founder of the National uh, Library of Tabriz. And um, how he got the manuscript is not known because we had seals on the manuscript, you see, on, uh, on the top of this uh, folio. Uh, but the seal, as usual, the seal of ownership, probably, have been erased. So Nachtfani himself pub had published two articles on this manuscript, but uh, without any analysis and without any discussion, about uh, the, the manuscript itself. It's just a plain transcript of two documents and actually not very representative of the whole content of the manuscript. And uh, he merely say that it was an old jong, which is a term to say, well, there is a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, the first to have seen the manuscript was the great German uh, scholar and specialist of Incha, Elibert Horst when the 50s came to Iran for his um, research on uh, the states or the administration of the Seljuk states and the Juarez Shah, and which was based on uh, Urkundan formula, so basically on Incha. And for this, he identified more than 10 sources, actually 11 sources, like uh, Jovani, Rashid al-Din Badfad, Baghdadi, et cetera. And he also saw the manuscript in Tabriz, and he wrote about it, a few lines. But since the manuscript deals with the room Seljuks, well, he didn't use the manuscript in his study, in his excellent study on the administration of the Greek Seljuk and the Khoras Shah. Um, Claude Cain himself had a photograph of the manuscript, but uh, he didn't use either the manuscript uh, in his uh, synthesis, I mean, the new version of his synthesis of uh, on pre-Ottoman Turkey that he published in French just before he died in 88. Um, <clears throat> so I must open here a parenthesis about what the Turkish, I mean, the scholarship on Persian Incha was first uh, a scholarship in Turkish and the pioneering work is uh, of course the work of uh, Osman Turon, who delivered a, a, a truly um, amazing book entitled "The Official Documents of the Room Seljuk," which combines an edition of text and a presentation of uh, of the source available. But Turon, for the reason we know, uh, could not um, well could not go on with a scholarship, unfortunately, and. Um, but it was emulated by other um, Turkish scholars, Adnan Erzi, who published, uh, who edited um, Insha manuscript uh, from uh, Hussam Eddin Khoi, the Ronyat al Katib, and uh, also Ali Sevim. So Ali Sevim uh, being the editor of the Mirat -e Zaman of Sipte uh, Benjawzi, and he also edited uh, the the Ikhwaniyat Insha by uh, Ibn al-Zaki, a very fine edition. Um, actually, two years ago at a small workshop we had just after the end of Corona at the Institut Français d'Etudes Anatoliennes in Istanbul with Andrew Peacock and my uh, dear friend uh, Osman Ali Özgüden, 
we we I discovered that uh, Osman Razi, Osgood Danley, had looked for the manuscript of Marashi, which was mentioned by Horst. He had looked for it in Tabriz, but he did not find it because it was not in Tabriz at that time. It was uh, well somewhere, uh, maybe already in Rome, but anyway, uh, it was out of the circuit of a scholarship. Now, a manuscript, a copy of this manuscript had been done in the 50s and with all the 60s for the University of Tehran. And uh, as such, the work was listed in the catalog written by Danish Pajou and Afshar, Musayer Khati. Um, but, well, their notice catalog as well, it is sometimes the case, and often the case for a jong or compilation, does not really do justice to the content of this manuscript, as they only mention 16 documents out of uh, 200. And actually, the documents with a clear relationship to Iran. But the manuscript is not so much about Iran. I mean, it's actually it's written in Anatolia and it deals with Anatolia. That's why they didn't really uh, uh, highlight it, its uh, Anatolian co content. Well, you, you should remember that at that time in Iran, uh, scholars were not so much, not as now as interested in the written heritage in Persian um, from Anatolia. By exception, of course, of uh, Jalal bin Balhi or Jalal bin Rumi. But apart from this, uh, there were so many manuscripts to be edited in Iran that they focused on what uh, had been written in Iran, uh, on Iran and not uh, on Anatolia. Um, so it remained the case until one of my dear and well intentioned colleague uh, drew my attention on this manuscript. I was, I've been in the, identified as a Saljuk specialist, as you know, although certainly not a specialist of a room Saljuk. And uh, I was invited to look at the manuscript and to uh, write um, a notice for the journal of, uh, of the Marashi journal, the Mirase Shahab, uh, which I did in 2020. Uh, an English version of this article, first published in Persian, was. Uh, um, printed in Dar Islam in 22. And um, on this basis, I decided, well, why not write a project uh, for the DFG? And that's where, that's why I'm now in Hamburg for two years uh, to deliver an edition and a commentary of this complicated manuscript. And now it's time to, to tell you why it is so complicated. Well, it's complicated because its genesis is really um, hmm, a conundrum. So let's look at some very basic codicological features. You have two clear hands in the manuscript. 80% of a manuscript is by a hand that I've called an hey, because it has no colophon, I will explain why. And uh, the 20 last folios uh, are by another hand. Well, the first hand is a very neat, very clear nas, uh, written with care. You have all the diacritic signs. Uh, the second hand is more hasted, but still very clear and very neat. Um, the lemata are in red, not uh, far bigger than the rest of the text, and uh, certainly not uh, like uh, the famous uh, Bibliothèque Nationale Supplément, Supplément Persan 1353, uh, in which you had the copy of uh, Bardadi Tawasuli La Tarasul, and the other uh, Incha work from Anatolia, where you have um, some, um, well, I won't say crazy layout, but uh, outstanding layout. And which was copied 
uh, in Antalya at the end of the 13th century. Uh, our manuscript, the Maharashi manuscript, is uh, well, more similar to, uh, for example, another copy of uh, the Baghdadi Starasul, which is uh, now found in, in Majlis, uh, where uh, it's a neat copy, there is a regular number of lines per page, the lemata are in red, and there is no bizarre signs. And uh, there is just on the Majlis um, manuscript, you see that there is a frame, and there is no frame on our Maharashi manuscript, which was uh, what was not common at that time to have a frame, as far as I understand. So what we have is a typical Divani manuscript of a rather small size, I would say. Um, yeah, like uh, half uh, A4 paper. Um, as for the content, well, it is composed of mixed insha. So when I say mixed insha, I mean it's a mix of ikhwaniyat and royal correspondence. And you have in the last part of the manuscript uh, some royal decrees. So it's called taqrirat wal manasib. So appointment to a uh, position inside the state. Uh, which correspond to uh, the sultaniyat according to the uh, medieval categories. And at the very end, you have a handful of mixed documents, so not only insha, but also uh, poetry. Um, what about the datation? Well, that's where uh, things start to be complicated. You have two pieces, two uh, hard piece of datation in the manuscript. You have two Vafat Name uh, at which are visible at the end of the part copied by uh, Kateb A. So the, the part in blue here. Um, the first is dated 788, and the second uh, at the beginning or at the very end of the 16th century. Um, well, the second Vafat Name is probably to be interpreted as an evidence that the manuscript at that time was already in Iran. And I would surmise that it was actually the case uh, by the end of the 14th century. Of course, it, uh, it's clear that uh, Persian continued to be written in uh, Anatolia, but um, maybe this uh, 13, 16th century Vafat Name in Persian is a uh, proof of uh, a neuron based um, uh, cotton. And beside this, you have one colophon from the year 716. And it's worth uh, quoting Tamat El Kitab Azat Tarasul, Bimahrusa Darazafari Aksarai. So it was made in Aksarai. At the beginning, of the month of Rabi al Akhar, of the year, um, of the year, Ashra uh, Wasitmiya. Well, I forget something here. Sitaj uh, Wasitmiya. Al Aliyad Azaf al Khalayq, Omar bin Muhammad al Katib. So, uh, well, it's interesting because um, Mahmoud Maharashi actually, in his notes, um, has, has, has misread this uh, colophon. You see here, there is a Sia inscription for the uh, hundred. But, um, well, I've checked with my Sia uh, expert, Emadeddin Sheikh uh, Al-Hokamai, and it's clearly uh, 700, not 600. So uh, the, the notes written by Mahmoud uh, Maharashi Najafi is, uh, is irrelevant. So we have a manuscript. The last part was written in the final days of the Ilkhanat. But at that time, we didn't know it was the final days. And keep this in mind, because we are still at the zenith of the Ilkhanat. It was the time of Uljaid. Uh, we do not know the Katib. 
And, uh, but he was in Aksarai, which was a Seljuk foundation on the main axis of the Rum Seljuk state from Antalya, Ponya to Kayseri. But at that time, the Seljuk had disappeared. Uh, well, they had disappeared quite uh, quietly, actually. Uh, but the documents copied in the Maharashi, so in the first part in blue by Kateb A, and in the second, in the last part by uh, this Umar ben Muhammad al Katib, all deal with the mid 13th century. Um, the problem is the genesis of the first part of the manuscript. And here, uh, it's a real, um, it's a real conundrum. So let's uh, let's look at it more closely. Um, the first page starts with the praise to the caliph, and this caliph is Caliph Mustansir. So Caliph Mustansir, as uh, we know, was the caliph famous for the Mustansiriya Madrasa in Baghdad. And he was the, uh, not the last, but the, well, the last, before the last, uh, the penultimate caliph, uh, Abbasid caliph. And he died, it's significant, in 1242. 1242. It's just one year before the Mongol uh, invasion of Anatolia. Uh, you have a reference also on this page on um, to um, a sultan, but this sultan is not named. There is just a reference. It's called Khosrow uh, Esterhar, and has it is a um, well, a Persian expression. But Khosrow, of course, is to be read. I think there is uh, no doubt about this as uh, the sultan Riyasuddin um, Khosrow the second who was the last independent sultan of the Rum Seljuk Sultanate, and the very sultan who was defeated by the Mongols and who died three years after the Battle of Koseda. So himself was, uh, belongs to the eighth generation of Seljuk ruler. And uh, you have to remember that uh, his grandfather, well, you know, it's grandfather, he was uh, the, the one with the 11 brothers, so it was a complicated thing. But at that time, the Seljuk, uh, Rum Seljuk Sultanate was uh, located in uh, western and central Anatolia, between Konya and Sivas. But uh, the seas were off limits, and uh, eastern Anatolia, well, eastern Anatolia being Armenia, uh, was also uh, an overworld and totally off limits. And you have a tremendous period of expansion uh, under his father, so under the father of our Sultan uh, Riyaseddin Khosrow, uh, during which uh, his uncle and his father conquered access to the two seas, Al Bahrain, the Black Sea, and the uh, Mediterranean Sea. With the conquest of uh, Antalya, Sinop, Alanya, and also an expansion toward the east, uh, which uh, uh, led the Seljuk state very uh, at the well, let's say in the third decade of the uh, 13th century to to neighbor the powerful Georgian states, and as a consequence, the Rum Seljuk and the Georgian would make an alliance, a defensive alliance against the uh, up and coming and very aggressive force, new force in Western Iran. I mean, of course, the Khwarez Shah. And to seal this alliance between the Rum Seljuks and the Georgians, uh, the prince, the Rum Seljuk prince, so the young Riyasuddin Khosrow too, it's going to be married to a Georgian princess, 
which is called Gorji Khatun in the sources. And you will see later what it is, why it is important for a manuscript. So let's go back now to the manuscript. I hope I have not lost you. <laughs> um, there are a number of oddities in this first part. The first is that the work begins as a very classical secretarial manual with a clear structure. So what do, we, what do I mean by secretarial manual? Well, I mean that first you have the formula to address someone when you write a letter. You know, it's very important. Uh, so it starts with a formula to address the highest ranking general, the Amir al-Umara, to, to the uh, least uh, important person at the court who will be an adib, and then you have formula to address the wife, the khatun, and then you have formula to address the eunuch, and then you have formula to address uh, the non-Muslim, uh, namely the Christian power. So this is here again, uh, very similar to what we have in Mayhani, where you have the whole section before the sample letter on how to start a letter. Because we know since Aristoteles that the most important thing in everything is the beginning. Uh, the fact that there is no titulature, there is no khitab for the sultan, for the room Seljuk sultan in this part is a clear indication that this section of the manuscript of this work was copied, was made, was authored by someone in the Seljuk century. Ch chancery, sorry. Uh, after this section, this khitab section is followed by several sample letters classified by subject. Here again, it's exactly like in Mayhani. Now I come back to the table that I had shown you, which is the table of content of Mayhani, so called Dastur et Dabiri, where you have the first section of Ikhwaniyat. So you have letters for longing, to express longing, gratitude, complaint, reproach, congratulation, condolence, caring, visit. And uh, in our manuscript, in the Maharashi, the beginning of the Maharashi manuscript, it's exactly the same. So there is a lot of letters for congratulation, Tahaniyat Name, less for condolences, which is also a very important social occasion, Daziat Name, Remonstrance, Etab Name, Friendship, Eshtiyak Name, letters to well, concerning a wedding, Arusi, letter to express a wish, Arizumandi, certificate of good and bad conduct, Govai, letter to speak about oneself, Tal Arz Dashte Halechod, letter in pure Persian, I'll come back to this later. And finally, the Sogan Name, the oath. So here yeah. it's very, uh, we are totally in line with what we found uh, in Khurasan in the previous century. But then after this section, we have a new section on Krita. And this time it is for the Sultan. So you remember, I told you that the Sultan was not in the first section, but it is in, the, in this new section on Kitab. And the Sultan is explicitly named, it's the Sultan Riyas ad din Kehoso. And now, in most of his documents quoted in this section, his son with the Georgian queen, with Gorji Khatun, a son which was named Aladdin, Aladdin is mentioned as the heir apparent, the Valley Ahd. And the author, we don't know his name. Well, I call him Kateb A. So this Kateb A, who wrote the first part of the, of the manuscript, goes at great length to uh, make his point, quoting very unexpected sources. For example, there is a document which is quoted not from a manuscript, but from a foundation inscription. And uh, the text, we, we read it in the Lemata, is quoted from an inscription uh, that can be read on um, 
the door of the caravanserai of Duden. And Duden being a place just outside the wall of Antalya. As far as I know, it's the only occurrence in an Insha manuscript where a text is quoted from, uh, not from um, a manuscript or uh, a letter, but from another kind of written article. If you know other occurrence, uh, please let me know. Um, the sole purpose of this section of Khitam, new section of Khitam, is to uh, legitimize the fact that the heir of the Sultan is Allah ed Din, so the son that the Sultan had with his Georgian princes. But we know because we have read Ibn Bibi, that when the Sultan died in 1246, he was not succeeded by Aladdin. He was succeeded uh, by his uh, elder house brother, Izzeddin al Rukun al-Din. And uh, Aladdin, well, somehow was sidelined and he rapidly died, uh, well, before his uh, 18th birthday on the road to Mongolia and was forgotten at the time when uh, Ibn Bibi wrote his chronicle. Um, so this manuscript is unique because it provides us a snapshot of the room Seljuk politics during the fourth and fifth, or no, the fifth and sixth decade of the 13th century a snapshot without the benefit of insight, benefit that even, even Bibi and of course Aksaray had. So let's continue our exploration of this manuscript because this is not the only oddity. Uh, remember that what I told you that manuscript began like a very clear secretarial manual with a structure very similar to the Khurasani model. But after the titulature on uh, for the Sultan and his son Aladdin, uh, you have what I call mixed insha. It's a series of letters without orders, uh, very similar to another insha work, which is called Al Muqtarat Min Al Rasai, which was copied in Western Iran at about the same time, where there is no uh, attempt to organize the documents between categories of Ikhwaniyat, Sultaniyat, and so on and so forth. But it's just series of letters. Wallahu, 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 aidan. And uh, in this series of letters, you find correspondence posterior to the death of the Sultan. So posterior to 1246. So not only that, <laughs> but the last document copied in this section is actually not an incha. It's uh, an Andar's name. It's the Andar's name Aristotelis. You know, it's a typical, uh, well, well known, well, well known by, uh, it's um, Hellenistic text which had been translated into Arabic and then into Persian at the Seljuk court in Isfahan and uh, in which Aristotelis provides advice to um, Iskandar. Uh, so it's, very different from uh, the uh, kind of uh, material that we had before. Uh, well, the only link with, uh, with this work is that this Andar's name of Aristoteles start by a letter. It is a letter sent by uh, Aristoteles to his Andar, but the content is very, very different. Um, so this is my problem. Um, and not only this, but um, the manuscript. So this Andar's name abruptly hands uh, in the middle of the copy. We don't know what happened, and this is why there is no colophon. Did he die? Did he just uh, forget about the manuscript? We cannot know. So I've tried to sum up in these tables um, the little things that do not add up as uh, my uh, 
master in uh, historical studies, Inspector Colombo uh, would say. So there's a lot of things that don't add up. First, we have a start with a man writing manual in a clear structure, and then the same hand, and in the same manuscript manuscriptical unit, you have a series of letters with no clear stru structure. The datation also is problematic. You have, it starts with a praise to a caliph who died in 1242, and then you have letters written after 1246. So what, uh, how, can, how can we understand this? Well, actually I have a lot of problem. I had made an, an hypothesis, actually I had published this hypothesis in my uh, Islam article, and uh, I had surmised a copy in several stages. First, the manuscript, the copy, began before Koseda, so before 1243, then interrupted uh, after Koseda, because, I mean, for the secretary in Konya, I mean, the world must have turned upside down, and they were not so sure, but that there is survival of the, of the room Seljuk state. And then the manuscript was started again after the death of the Sultan, Riyaseddin, uh, when the survival of the Rum Seljuk state, although in a new configuration, uh, was ensured. But at that time, uh, the, the author did not have the same ambition. It didn't want to write a manual with a clear structure, it just copied it. I'm less sure of, I'm not so sure of this uh, hypothesis now. Actually, I'm in, in this part of a research where, uh, you know, you are so much inside the manuscript that uh, you don't see clear. Um, I'm not even sure that we may find a solution, but what I am sure is this. The Kati worked at Konya. He was a secretary at Konya with very good access to the documents. Maybe he was a chancellor, or maybe he was someone like Abu Fadl Bayhafi, a Munshi working with the chancellor. Second, this Kati, was linked to the Georgian party at the court. Because as in every court, there is different party. Uh, you have um, different kind of thinking. And um, before Koseda, before the Mongol invasion, I mean, the most powerful party was the Georgian party. That means the party of the queen, of the Georgian queen. Um, and she could have hoped to have her son uh, which one will have been appointed her apparent to succeed his father. And we have a lot of elements in the manuscript indicating a Georgian connection. And the third thing I am certain about uh, the, the genesis about this manuscript is that the difference of structure clearly reflects um, the situation of the Seljuk state. The, the first folios where you have a, a manual with a clear structure, you have someone who wants to emulate a Khurasani Insha, but he wants to adapt it to the Anatolian context. But after uh, folio 31, it's not the same thing. The ambition is not the same and just copies for whatever reasons uh, letters he had at his disposal. Maybe it's even a uh, personal manuscript a subject on which I've written in a recent volume with Jorgen Paul. Um, well, as I say, the exact context of this manuscript might not be, uh, might, might, might never be solved. Uh, however, what we have are documents on the history of the Rune Seljuk in the 1240s and in the 12. 50s with text composed slightly before and slightly after the Mongol invasion. So to finish this presentation, I thank you for your patience. I will service some of the insights that this manuscript gives for historians as well as for manuscript specialists of literature. So I'm just going to list uh, the direction of research I'm working on. And I will uh, pick the first one to give some example. Um, there is many information on Persograph 
cartography, what I call the implementation of Iranian norms in Anatolia, with templates, with tiles. Um, you have a lot of information of administrative history on the structure of the Seljuk state, for example, as it is reflected by the lockup of its official. It's a recent article I have written, not yet published. And there is a lot of data on the political history of the decade before and after Poseda, uh, like uh, the role of the Georgian party at the Seljuk court, like the role of the Mongols, you hear of Batu, of Beiju, and like the relationships between the son of the Sultan Riyas al Din Khosro, which is a subject I will deal next week at a conference in St. Andrews, conference on Izeddin, one of the half brother of uh, al -Adin. And you have something um, that Iranian will maybe connect more, which is the Ir Iranian network in Anatolia, because you have a strong Isfahani network uh, visible uh, at the court of Konya and in this manuscript in particular. So the five last minutes, I would give you some information about what I, what I, what I mean by insight in persography. So in a nutshell, this manuscript shows Persian Uber Alus. Uh, all the letters are in Persian. Even those who are not from or for a Persian working chancery. We know that the Rum Saljuk chancery did not operate only in Persian, but uh, this is not visible from this manuscript. Uh, actually, you have even a letter sent to the Ayyubid by Juarez Shah, who is in Persian. So that it means that the Rum Saljuk wrote in Persians when they wrote to the Ayyubids? Well, that's, uh, that's a question, that's an open question. Um, there is very few artifacts that better show the reality of what we can call the Persography or the Persian at world uh, as this manuscript. Uh, naturally, there is no thing in Turkish, no letter in Turkish, and you have only a handful of Turkish words in what we call the Nu'ud, which are the epithets given to uh, given individuals before or after the honorific titles. So uh, let's see what's, uh, you know, the formulaic looks like when you start a letter. It's always the same formula, so it's like, uh, it's like code. Actually, it will be very good for uh, uh, AI. So it starts with a wish. With a verb at the end uh, in, uh, in yellow, bod. Uh, so may the royal fortunes uh, ride side by side next to the auspicious life of his highness. And then you have uh, the description of the, of the recipient. You have his title here. It's the Amir Sepah Salar. You have the epithet for the Nuhut. Ajal, Kabir, Alem, Adel, Mu'ayyat, Muzaffar, Mansur, Mujahed, Mohsen, Mohaven. Then you have the Laqab, usually 10, sometimes 20 for the most important uh, uh, persons. And then for the military, this is where it's uh, important for Turkish, you have another series of nudes in Turkish. So this Usarbashi, which is a, a military rank, is called Alp, Utlur, Ulur, Homayun, well, which is not Turkish, Vulka, Vulka being uh, Bilge, so uh, the equivalent of uh, the Persian Dana. And then the function of, uh, of this person, Usarbashi Bak, and then the prior. And finally, the invocation with Muhammadin Wali. Uh, and this is all for Turkish. But actually, it's more than uh, in the Insha manuscript that we have in Iran. Uh, as far as I remember, there is uh, no Turkish nude. Uh, what about the styles? 
Well, the style is uh, as expected ornate, ornate prose, but uh, the complexity varies uh, in the matna, you know, in the main text of the letters, it really depends on the identity of the author and uh, the recipient. Uh, for example, in the letter exchanged by the room Saljuk prince or co-sultans, like uh, Izzeddin and Aladdin, it's going to be a person, uh, well, a, little, a nice person, but very straightforward, a little bit uh, similar to the letters exchanged by the Atabeg of Azerbaijan, which are kept in the Muhtarat Mir uh, a series of letters that I had studied uh, 15 years ago, thanks to an invitation by Denis Zeg, contribute to uh, a diplomatic, um, diplomatic history in uh, the Middle East. Uh, but for the Ikhwaniyat, it's another, I mean, it's another level, uh, especially the Ikhwaniyat uh, between the member of the Isfahani networks, where here you reach a level of complexity, uh, which, uh, which makes the translations uh, quite uh, hard. Um, the most extreme example of this ornate example is a letter sent by the Juarez Shah to Salah Eddin for uh, the conquest of uh, Jerusalem. So this letter so deals with the 12th century, not the 13th century. And it's one of the few letters dealing, not connected to the history of the Rome Seljuks. And it was probably written by Rashid Eddin Vatfat. And well, I must say that he outdid himself in this composition. And I have found, I believe it's one of the most difficult texts ever written in Persian, uh, Ornat prose, more difficult than the hardest part of that stuff, which is in itself uh, the benchmark for Ornat prose. Um, but well, as you know, specialists of literature know that the Persian written in Anatolia is uh, on purpose more elaborate, more complex, more abstruse than the Persian written in Iran. Um, conversely, this is very interesting. You find also letters in pure Persian, what uh, we call the Farsi Mahz or Farsi Sare. So uh, here, contrary to the letters which are stuffed with Arabic words. These are letters without any Arabic words, like uh, this one. So it starts with a kind of kitab uh, similar to the formula I had shown you. And then you have the nud, but the nud are all in Persian. Ajaman, Bandenavaz, Dadgostar, etc. Then you have uh, the names of the honorific title, Shams uh, And um, the novel nudes, uh, Danesh Paju, Roshan Rai, and continuation of the wish and the, uh, the prior. So uh, this is probably a pure rhetorical exercise. And these letters, well, I don't think they were meant to be sent. But they indicate at least that the secretaries were aware that their person, that the person where they, they used was very Arabized and maybe uh, too much Arabized. Uh, I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, there are three letters in pure, in pure person which have been uh, investigated by my friend called Maria Mir Shamsi recently. Um, and let's finish with the last example, which are uh, about the implementation of Iranian norms in Anatolia, which are the Sogan Name, the oath, uh, which is a very Iranian type of text. Um, so you have two Sogan Name in our Marashi, and you can compare them to Iranian example, which are kept in uh, Incha collection. Uh, for example, the collection of uh, Baghdadi, uh, the Leningrad manuscript, 
and Mohtarat uh, Menarasail as well. And uh, well, the structure as expected is, is very much the same, of course. But the wording is, uh, is, 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 is a little bit different, um, especially for the punitio. So the punitio is the most funny thing in the Sogan Name. Uh, so basically a Sogan Name, to swear that you're going to be uh, loyal to Sultan. And uh, at the end, he say, if I am not loyal or if I break my oath, then um, I will be punished by this and this and this. So like, uh, I will have to divorce uh, all my wife to, uh, to give all my, 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 my fortunes. Uh, and uh, there is also some uh, ideological or religious pollution, uh, punishing. So in uh, the Anatolian Sogan Dame, uh, it's not just I will hate God as we find it in Iranian Sogan Dame. He goes very much into the details. I mean, he's going to hate God, he's going to hate the Quran, he's going to hate the 124,000 prophets of God. And not only this, but he's going to manifest it openly. Uh, so insults, you, know, you don't have any mentions of insult to our gods in Sogan Name written in Iran. But in Anatolia, uh, you have, and you are going to show also preference for Judaism, which are, of course, uh, it amounts to a death condemnation. But um, in Iran, it's uh, not formulated. So why is this? Um, well, I, I have summarize it as by the following sentence. The Sogan in Seljuk Anatolia closely mirrors that of Iran, yet it exhibits greater severity in ideological terms while being less demanding in practical aspects, like uh, divorcing the wives and etc. And uh, maybe we can link this with uh, the recent finding of Andrew Peacock in his uh, 2019 uh, excellent book, Islam Literature and Society in Mongol Anatolia, in which he noted a particular emphasis on the theme of disbelief uh, in the manuscript that were copied at that time. And um, the Amzanami or the many Siraj of Kulu. Um, well, that's an hypothesis. Well, I have to thank you for having listening so far to this long talk. I was very happy to have time to, uh, to really present you in detail this, what I believe is an important and uh, but also a complex manuscript. Um, I hope I have been able to highlight some of its problem. And uh, I, I do welcome your questions, your remark, your criticism. Uh, and if you are watching this video uh, on the site of the uh, Academy, uh, please feel free to reach me directly on my email, my Yahoo email, and uh, as my Hamburg address is uh, temporary. Um, thank you very much. And for those in line, I'm waiting for your questions.